Hi, welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. Um, this is a brief introduction to this month's video because uh, during the recording of the Google Hangout on air, I had some problems during the recording of the short stories. Um, basically, I'd managed to get somebody else's face <laughs> as part of the video rather than focusing on me. That was just me doing all this stuff at very short notice. So I have re-recorded the stories again, kind of rather hurriedly. Um, anyway, in order to get the video as quickly as possible, I'm now re-recording the short stories. So you will see there are jumps in the uh, video this evening. Anyway, I hope you enjoy chattering with Nicholas Vince. So I'm just going to say, hi, this is Nicholas Vince. Uh, welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. Uh, originally, I was hoping that uh, Simon Bamford was going to be with me this evening to do uh, the luggage and the crypt interviews. Um, but Simon's had to send his apologies because something has come up. Uh, he's fine, um, but something's come up. Um, so it'll just be me, um, and possibly just me and Vicky, uh, who's also with me this evening. Um, and I'm going to read a couple of the short stories from What Monsters Do. Um, I have very definitely made this a um, 18 years and over only podcast uh, broadcast, as uh, one of the stories I'm going to read is Nursery Rhymes from, once, from What Monsters Do. And that's got some very adult themes in it. Um, but, uh, yeah. So what I, I'm going to share with you is I got a link sent through to me um, this morning. Uh, I got one uh, last night. Uh, Vicky, I'm just going to... Vicky, could you do me a favor? Could you just mute yourself? Cool. And I'm just going to mute Derek as well. Just whilst I do this... Um, uh, hi, welcome, Derek. Welcome on board. Um, I was just saying, hi. Um, I was just saying, I received a link to a film called Sophie's Fortune. Um, now, this is a short film. It was made for a couple of thousand pounds over a few years up in the north of England, although it's set in all sorts of exotic places. Um, they've really gone to town on this. Um, I really do recommend uh, checking out. It's free. You just need to sign up. Um, I'm guessing it's going to be for the newsletter so you can, they can keep you informed about what's happening with the film. Um, and that's at www.sophiesfortune.com and you will be able to watch the film for free. I saw it uh, on the big screen um, up in Manchester uh, last year. It really is good fun. Um, news about uh, a most recent um, appearance. Um, this is going to be possibly... I don't know, but this may be my only appearance in the UK this year. Certainly it's probably the first one I've done for about 12 months. Um, and that's going to be at the Living Dead Con in Liverpool on the 11th of October. Um, that's in Liverpool. It's a one-day event. And I'll be there selling photographs, selling uh, books, signed books, etc., etc. And that's going to be on, as I say, the 11th of October. And you can find out more about that on at the living www.thelivingdeadcon.com. Okay. Um, and the last thing to uh, announce is that Barbie Wild is going to be joining me for August. Um, Barbie is going to be doing the Luggage in the Crypt interview with me. Um, this will after this will be after we've got back from Flashback Weekend, which is in Chicago, on um, the 8th to the 10th of... Yeah, I fight on the Thursday, so it's the 8th, 9th, and 10th of August. Uh, both Barbie and I will be having a mini Hellraiser reunion. Um, so uh, I hope to see you there. Um, that'd be great, and I hope to see you in Liverpool if you're in the UK. Um, because as I say, that's as far as I'm aware, uh, although I believe there may be something else happening. Um, but at the moment, it's the only, um, it's the only uh, uh, convention I'm going to be doing in, um, in the United Kingdom. So, um, the other thing is, I, I want to, I'll have a chat with you when we open up the, the chat later on. Um, I'm going to start doing horror film reviews, and I want to get your feedback on what sort of horror films, because, again, I want to kind of make it an interactive thing so that we can all decide on what film we're going to watch and then go away and watch it and all do our little review, you know, do a little 
two or three minute review. Um, I'll probably start off with five minutes and then I'll limit, depending on the number of people who want to do this, probably limit to two or three minutes. And I'll probably limit that show to a 30 minute show rather than the hour for the normal um, chattering with Nicholas Vince. But that'll be chatter chattering with Nicholas Vince about movies. Um, and the main thing about this, of course, in my reviews is I am a big scaredy cat. So um, we'll be, I'll be awarding scaredy cats, uh, depending on the number, of how, how frightening I found it. Cool. So I'm going to uh, welcome, uh, found that. so let me just maximize that over my uh, notes. So we've got Derek there. Hi, Derek. Uh, Fernando's joined us. Uh, Derek, I want to just make sure you, yep, you are muted. It's weird. Yours doesn't show that you're muted. Okay, but Vicky, I'm going to unmute because Vicky, if I click on the right thing, Vicky, can you unmute yourself? Yay. Yeah. No, I've just muted you again. Yeah, you've unmuted there. yourself. You've unmuted yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so you had some news you wanted to share with us, Vicky. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, I am a member of this anime of this uh, forum website called Gaia.com, Gaia Online, and they are even though they focus on anime, there is a lot of other things they do as well. Every now and then, they hold contests to see who would get to make a new customized item. Well, I managed to win, and I got my item approved a couple of weeks ago, so hopefully in mid-September there will be a Hellraiser item in time for the movie's 27th anniversary. Oh, that's cool. That's very, very cool. And when you say an item, what's it kind of going to be made out of? Uh, it's a, it's, since it's online, it's like an anime site, it's uh, pretty much a pixelized doll site. So oh, okay. Um, there's different what's called poses. So my little poses I have chosen are there's going to be the laminate configuration, right. pinhead pins and grid, the female Cenobite's neck wound, chatterer's mouth and neck wires, a mod to make your head look like butterballs, uh -huh. and a little companion item to feature the, all the Cenobites, um, female Cenobite, chatterer, butterball, Chenard from, um, from Hellbound, Princess right. Angelique from... Bloodline and Merkova from the Epic Comics, since well, couldn't do Pinhead. They already have a Pinhead like character there. Right, right. Mhm. Mm oh, cool. So you're gonna have what? A, a half a dozen? Near, how many? How many characters is that in total? Uh, in total, in my in my item, there's going to be six. Seven okay. if you include the extra one with Pinhead. Right, right. Oh, cool. That sounds very, very cool. <clears throat> Right, okay, well, you'll no doubt come back to us later and uh, um, let us know when we can see it, etc. Cool, thank you very much indeed, Vicky. Um, right, I'm now just going to take a sip of water because I'm going to be reading for about the next 15 minutes or so. <clears throat> I do apologize, this Simon was only able to get hold of me last night and I was only able to let... Uh, people know uh, yes, uh, today around about lunchtime that he wasn't going to be joining me. And um, as you can see, I've got a different background behind me um, today, and there's, there's a lot more dramatically lit um, around here. And so basically we've spent the whole day putting up curtains, and then there's a, a blackout blind that went up at the window. Um, so just kind of make, beginning to make this look as professional as possible. But I kind of not too happy with these blank spaces here, so I might try and think of something else that I can hang there as well, um, just to kind of fill in the space a bit. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, yeah, yeah, to set the atmosphere, says Fernando. That's right, yeah. <laughs> it helps set the atmosphere, particularly for the readings. Okay. The Worst Day by Nicholas Vince. Howard Shepherd and his wife were arguing over the cooling body of their 17-year-old son, Ewan. This is your fault, she said. You know that, don't you? I didn't know this would happen. I didn't want this. I didn't mean. You don't listen. You never listen. It's not like you weren't told, you bastard. She slapped his face. Uh, Mrs. Shepherd, I'm going to have to ask you to calm down, said the surgeon. I'm, I'm so sorry, but we do need you to make a decision. 
do we have permission to use his organs for transplant? For a moment, Howard and the surgeon both thought she would hit the surgeon too. She swayed slightly, and they had to catch her by the arms as she crumpled. They guided her into a plastic chair. Uh, Mr. Shepherd, I really am sorry, but I do need you to make a decision. Can we help others? He noticed the surgeon didn't say, use his organs now, and he felt frightened by her manipulation of him. He felt frightened as she tempted him to say yes, just so that all this would be over. He looked from the surgeon to his wife, tears rolling down his cheeks. He's my son. I, I love him. No, 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 you can! Then he stumbled out of the room, and it was away down the corridor towards his car. He pushed past the police constable who'd been waiting for Ewan to recover, so he could answer questions. He hurried by the other lad's parents. Rather than look at him, he concentrated on the posters on the wall. When he got to the car, he looked back to see the policeman had followed him to the doors of the hospital. When he realised Howard was heading for his car, he ran after him, calling, Mr. Shepherd, Howard, wait! Howard got in the car and started the engine, desperate to get home. He had to get to the computer before they started asking questions about what was on it. They couldn't know what his son may have left behind. The rain was pouring down, which meant it was difficult for the policeman to recognise his car once he got into the evening rush hour. He chanced a short one-way street against the traffic. Leaving the city, he headed north for the village. The further he got, the more he relaxed, and the less he glanced into the rearview mirror, looking for a flashing blue light. He started rehearsing stories for the police. They were similar to the ones he'd told a newspaper a while back. Firstly, this wasn't cage fighting. This was mixed martial arts. This was good for the kids. They enjoyed it. It was better that they were doing this rather than walking around the streets with knives, killing each other. Was that what people wanted? Kids with knives? He thought of the barn with the cage. No, arena. Uh, no, boxing ring. Then thought of the dark stains on the floor and the camera linked to the website. Perhaps he should burn the barn. No one would come to the fights now, not after this. He looked in the rearview mirror, into the face of his son. Hi, Dad, said Ewan. Turning to look into the back seat, Howard swerved into a ditch, killing the engine. He heard the rain beat on the roof and his own terrified panting, nothing else. He sat there for a few moments, not daring to look into the back seat, waiting for a cold, clammy hand to be placed on his shoulder. He shook himself and got out of the car and looked into the back seat. Empty. He let out a snorting laugh of relief. It was just his imagination, damn it. He stood back to inspect the damage to the car. It wasn't going anywhere. He looked around him and recognised the hill he was on. It was another couple of miles to the farm and the barn. He could cut across country and perhaps make it before the police. It was important that Ewan be seen as the victim in this, that it was the other boy who'd murdered him. He knew the story had holes, but he could work on those as he walked. Soon he was soaked through and shivering. The ground was muddy and treacherous, but that didn't matter. He had to do this for Ewan. He walked on, scared to go faster as he kept slipping in the mud. Now he was off the ridge of the hill. The heaviness of the rain and the late evening light meant he couldn't see more than ten feet in front of him. Hello, Mr. Shepherd. He stopped walking and looked up from the mud. Jason, Ewan's best friend, was standing in front of him, dressed in a hospital gown. You shouldn't be here. You should be back in the hospital, son. Oh, oh I am. I'm in a coma. I just said I'd come and give Ewan a hand, said Jason. Oh, I don't understand. It's simple, Dad. Really, really simple, said Ewan, stepping out of the rain. But but you're dead. It's okay, Ewan. You don't need to worry. I'll get to the house before the police. I'll destroy the barn, wipe the computer, take down the website. They won't know where you set everything up. Both young men laughed. You have no idea, do you, Dad? said Ewan. Once something's on the web, it's there for good. Besides, you're missing the point. Howard looked at them, his mouth moving slightly as he tried to find words but utter, uttering nothing. Dad, how do you think we got like this? said Ewan. 
Ewan painfully pulled off his hospital gown. Howard looked at his naked son. He looked at the swollen eyes, only one of which was open. His lips were inflated and bleeding, his nose bloated and twisted where it was broken. There were yellow, purple bruises around his chest, shoulders, abdomen and legs. Howard looked down at Ewan's feet at his broken toes, where, the doctors told him, someone had stamped on them. On them. Ewan turned to show his back, where he'd obviously been kicked. Well, you, you two were practising, said Howard. Things got out of hand. You, you, you'd argued over Rody, Rosie. I know you both fancied her. I don't know. But look, we, we can sort this out later. Uh, if I destroy the barn, it'll be harder to prove it was you. Ewan turned back to him and moved closer. Us, Dad? It was us. You and me. Though it was your idea, remember? Howard saw the blood speckle from his lips as he spoke. A couple of years ago, do you remember? said Ewan. Once the farm was losing money, we had to find another income. You saw that film, saw us lads with not much to do except get into the street fights on a Friday night, thought you'd do the village a favour, gave us a club to go to where we could work out our frustrations. You set up the barn. Took you a couple of months to start charging admission for your mates to watch the bouts. Then you found those websites and decided we too could do better, could make real money. You said you enjoyed it. I was fifteen, Dad. Howard reached out towards his son in a comforting gesture, but Ewan stepped back. Howard waited for his son to continue, but he stood there without speaking. He looked at Jason, but he stared at him expressionless. Howard turned his collar up and pulled his jacket tighter against the rain. So, who did this to you? Howard said. Well, Dad, these gentlemen from your other website, the one you got Jason here to set up for you, thanks for wanting a mum and I not to know, thanks for protecting us. I had no idea there were men this desperate to earn a few dollars. Howard squinted his eyes against the rain, which drove more heavily now, and looked beyond Ewan and Jason. Shadows shuffled forward, became more substantial, as they closed on him. I guess you knew they were beating out their friends, neighbours, brothers. Did you choose the categories, Dad? Fathers fighting sons? Was that your idea? I understand twins are popular, but of course that's not where the real money lies. Forget late night TV, forget sex and death in ancient Rome. You provided the real thing, didn't you, Dad? Oh, well, you die and learn. There were perhaps twenty of the shadows, blooded, faces puffed, eyes gouged, missing, jaws swinging loose and with all with raw knuckles. None of them looked strong. Howard reasoned these were the losers and was ashamed Ewan had let himself be beaten. He looked at these echoes of men and found he wasn't afraid now. He knew these were just ghosts or his imagination. He thought it was his own guilt triggered by the shock of watching his son die. Either way, they meant nothing and could not harm him. He started walking again towards the barn where he'd find petrol. So what, if Ewan and Jason were right that the sites would still be on the web? It's not like he'd used his real name when he set these things up. Howard was shocked when the first blow actually hurt. It was like the dead arms he used to get at school. The thug who tormented him most knew the trick of protruding the knuckle of the middle finger, supported by the thumb. It was useless on bone, but punched into the upper arm, it was much more painful than a plain fist. The blow was so physical, he realised his attacker was real. That made him angry. He was no bloody victim. He'd been in the cage a few times himself. He twisted his body so he could put his full weight behind the blow. His right fist shot out and he knew that when it crushed the gristle of the guy's face, it would feel good and there'd be a satisfying crunch. He exulted in this and felt so alive in control. He would beat the world to a pulp, and these losers wouldn't stand a chance. He stumbled forward as his fist passed through the rain in front of him. He felt a blow to his belly and started to fold forward. No, he whispered, concentrating on disbelief as if it might protect him. He straightened up and looked for his son. Ewan, please, this isn't fair. How do I fight these? His arms were grabbed and stretched, so he stood a cruciform. 
Ewan slapped him across the face twice and then stood back whilst the others delivered the beating. Somehow he could tell the blows which were delivered by professionals and those by amateurs. When his legs gave out, he was kneed in the face, his head snapping back. He spat blood and tried to focus on how he could escape this. Stop, said Ewan. He was pulled to his feet and groggily lifted his face to look at his son. Ewan, thank you. For what? You're not going anywhere. You've just been tenderized. Ewan punched his sternum. Howard didn't understand. The blows weren't as powerful as the others and not as painful. You boxed for the soft belly, so this made no sense. Ewan was hitting him slowly, methodically. He built a rhythm. One, two. One, two. At first he watched his father's eyes, looking for the reaction, smiling when his father groaned. Then he looked down to concentrate on the blows. One, two. One, two. The speed of the blows increased. Howard felt sick and at first couldn't understand why his left arm hurt so much. The pain roared and he just wanted it cut off. As he was concentrating on this, he didn't notice when Ewan ceased hitting him and his heart stuttered and stopped. There was a tearing as his body fell forward. Still held upright, he saw the back of his own head fall away from him, then his shoulders and back dropped forward until he was looking down at himself, his face in the mud. The pain stopped. There was a light just beyond Ewan. Howard could feel the warmth, comfort, salvation and joy in it. He stepped forward and was pulled back. Ewan slapped him across the face and it stung. He was punched in a kidney and it hurt. He saw the light fading as his beating continued. Cool. So that's the first one. That's the worst day. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so if you'd like to unmute yourselves. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Thank you for waving the light. <clears throat> uh, for waving, Fernando, Vicky, did you uh, did you want to say anything about that? I thought it, I thought it was cool. Um, I do have a question. What was the inspiration yes. for it? It was. I wrote it when I was away on a writer's course immediately. Uh, so it's a couple of years ago now. Um, and I was out in the West Country, and that's my best West Country accent that you were listening to there. Um, so it was definitely written in the West Country. Um, and it was this idea of a ghost where they could really affect you. And then I kind of got the idea of you know, and, and the original when I originally, it was just the idea of somebody standing at a bus stop in the middle of the country road, um, and then he, he meets the ghost, and it's the ghost of a boxer, and the ghost keeps punching him, and even though he's a ghost, it causes him to have a heart attack, and he dies. And then I just kind of played around with that idea, and then there's that thing about, you know, there's this thing of fathers and sons. And then I'd read an article online about... Um, uh, mixed martial arts and 15 year old boys this is in the United Kingdom uh, 15 year old boys being involved and I just thought actually I think they were young as 13 13 year old boys being involved um, and in fact I met somebody who'd actually been at one of these things and he said yeah it was wrong we had to stop the, you know it was supposed to start as a way of getting kids to channel their anger you know the same reason that you get kids to um, do judo. Um, so there was kind of all these things and they just kind of came together and then I just I had to write, I wrote this story in a week, I was I had, in four days I was there and I had to and we shared what we'd worked on at the um, the writers course uh, we read them to each other on the uh, on the fourth evening um, so I knew I had a deadline, I had to have something finished by the end of that deadline um, so yeah, that's how it came came about. Any other questions? 
No, there is nothing. Fernando shaking head. Okay, cool, cool. All right, in that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to minimize Safari again, and we'll go for the next one. Now, I have to warn you boys particularly. Can I just ask quickly? I'll just maximize that again. Derek, have you read What Monsters Do? Have you read No, I have. Yeah, uh, I, have but I just finished uh, your other book, uh, uh, Other People's Darkness. Other People's Darkness. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So this is the first time you're going to hear this. Nursery Rhymes by Nicholas Vince. The blade on the pendulum is falling closer to me with each arc. I don't know how much time I have before it slices into my face or groin. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, cock or face are first to go. There are rats here. I can feel them clawing at my hands, running over my legs. I'm tied naked, and there are rats. It's very Edgar Allan Poe, isn't it? I wonder how Sinclair managed to build all this. As revenges go, it's pretty extreme, but then I did kill him. To be fair, he did come back. It was Mother who opened the door to Sinclair. The first I heard of his arrival was her screaming, Sinclair! Oh my God, it's Sinclair! I had no idea what she was talking about and thought perhaps she'd finally lost it. I came downstairs to find my brother standing in the hallway, while Mother hugged him and sobbed into his shoulder. Oh, darling, but you're so cold, we must get you something to eat and warmed up, she said. Later, Mum, he said. I'm really not that hungry, I'm just glad to be home. Where have you been, son? said Father. It's nearly a year we were on the point of declaring you legally dead. There's just a lot of darkness, rushing river water, and then the next thing I remember is being in hospital. I'd been washed out to sea. No identification and no memory of who I was. It's only just come back to me. I'll tell you the details later, Dad. It's a miracle, said Mother. All those prayers, the countless times I asked God to give me back my son, and now here he is. James, you said he, we had to move on, that we had to declare him dead, but look! Here he is. It's so wonderful. James, isn't it wonderful? Oh, frabshous day, kalu kalay, I chortle in my joy, I said. James, stop being so clever. You and your rhymes, you read too many books. You know that, don't you? said Mother. She released her hold of Sinclair, and he took a step towards me. I couldn't help it. I took a step back. It's all right, James. I used to like your funny poems, he said as he walked towards me. When he grasped his hand, it was so cold, so very cold. It was as if he'd just stepped out of a freezer. He pulled me close, hugging me. It was then I spelled him. We'd had rats a few months before, and a couple had died under the floorboards. That's what he smelled like, a dead rat. I wondered why mother and father hadn't noticed, but I don't think my mother would have cared. I opened a window by the front door. I needed some fresh air to help clear my head. I remember you tried to save me. Isn't that right, James? Yes, of, of course. I lied. I hadn't tried to save him. I killed him. I know I killed him after I... Never mind. I killed him. It was all very confusing. He was cold. He stank of death. He looked pale, but not dead. He didn't shamble or make any attempt to eat our brains. That was when I realized I'd gone into shock. Thinking he was a zombie was just the shock of seeing him again. James, said Father, close the window. It's cold and raining outside. Sinclair, you're a bit whiffy, son. Yes. Sorry, Dad, said Sinclair. I had to sleep rough last night. There's a clock here. As well as the sound of the machinery behind the pendulum, I think I can hear it ticking. It's large, ebony, and there is blood dripping from its face. Not sure if it's the red blood dripping or the clockwork ticking I hear. It chimes the hours in the wrong order, and the hands do not move. I've heard people who are in terrible situations, soldiers on the front line, people in sinking boats, call for their mothers. Actually, I think they call for their mummy. I don't have one. I have mother and father. Sinclair has mum and dad. Same people. Different parents. Thinking of the past is helping me take my mind off the rats. 
I was sent to boarding school when I was five years old and stayed there until I went to university. My parents simply wanted me out of the way as much as possible. Being a bastard, I was an embarrassment to them both. You see, my father wasn't exactly in love with my mother when I was born, and they certainly weren't married. One night, he persuaded her that as they had nowhere else to go, his car in a dark, muddy country lane was as romantic as it was going to get. I have occasionally speculated what it must have been like in that car with the windows steamed up. Apparently it was a very nice BMW with leather seats. I wish I'd never known that. So I can't help thinking about the rhythmic sound of creaking leather and the difficulty of removing stains. Perhaps he had a travel rug ready. If he did, no doubt the travel rug had served a similar purpose in other country lanes. After all, it was a company car, and he was a good-looking young salesman. Father and mother saw each other regularly after that first time, as she proved both enthusiastic and adept at the spatial awareness necessary for these fuckings. For her, this was a rebellion against her privileged and very formal upbringing. For him, there was the thrill of bedding the boss's daughter. They continued like this until my mother informed him she was pregnant and not about to have an abortion. He promised her faithfully that he would stand by her decision. He left within an hour. It took my grandfather eight months to find and persuade him to come back, by which time I could have attended their white wedding. All this I learned in a school holiday, listening to after-dinner drunken recriminations. It didn't matter that I heard, as I didn't really count. I lived at the periphery of their vision. I think my brother's birth saved their marriage. Perhaps it was those magic words, our son, with the added layer of respectability that wedlock provided. That and Sinclair's blue eyes, blonde hair, grace, and utter charm. A real trip off the old block. By the time he was a teenager, it was clear he had the same way with women as my father. Sinclair was not sent to boarding school. We met only gr briefly at Christmas holidays, when I could admire the more extravagant presents he'd receive. Summer holidays I spent with my grandparents whilst my parents and Sinclair holidayed abroad. Guess what? I was bullied at school as the boy whose parents didn't love him. So yes, naturally I read books. Lots and lots of books. Books weren't my friends. It would be ridiculous to, to think that. This friendship requires dialogue. But they were my solace. I got a first-class degree in computing, and my grandfather, who obviously felt sorry for me, gave me a job at the family firm. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. He didn't like me or feel any particular warmth, he just felt it was the right thing to do for one's family. Still, decent enough of him to insist I move back into the family mansion. Neither my parents or Sinclair congratulated me on my first. There is an eye watching me. It is magnified in one of the walls, a pale blue eye. Perhaps it is Sinclair's watching to see if I'm dead yet. The ticking has moved. I can hear it from beneath the floorboards. There are whispered arguments. I hear them talking of burying me whilst I'm still alive or throwing me into the pit, which they say is near me. I see his game now. He's intent on driving me insane. He won't kill me. He can't. It would be too messy, too difficult to explain how I was split in half. He will not kill me. He's just trying to scare me. Gears shift and the blade drops a few more inches towards me. Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. A year ago there was a sales conference. Sinclair was the company's sales director in my grandfather's firm. My father was managing director, the obvious sweetener that brought him back to my mother. In Sinclair's words, I was just a data monkey, working in the management information systems department. In his eyes, I'd only been at the conference as I'd been the analyst who prepared the charts and slides. However, Grandfather liked us all to be at these things, except Mother, of course. As much as she might have wanted to see her darling boy inspiring the sales force with twinkling eyes and charming wit, occasionally at my expense, there was, a, there was no way my grandfather and father would let her curtail their fun at the evening celebrations. Everyone knew that what happened at the sales conference stayed at the sales conference. I found the evening boorish. But any complaint I had against Sinclair's cronies would simply be ignored. They sickened me. 
and I left for my room as soon as I could. I ensured the door was locked and chained so I could read undisturbed. Next day, Sinclair had to be at Heathrow Airport at 7am for the flight to South Africa, a year-end incentive for him and the top three sales guys. It had been agreed, by which I mean I'd been told, I would drive him the three hours to the confer- from the conference hotel. The others would go by minibus. It was still dark and he was still drunk as we left. There was torrential rain. The stink of alcohol from his skin nauseated me. Fifteen minutes into the journey, he asked me if this lovely, leathered up holstered BMW reminded me of anything. No, Sinclair, I said. Are you sure, James? I mean, I know you can't possibly remember the actual night, but doesn't this sound make you think of Mum and Dad? He squirmed in his seat, making the leather creak slowly at first, then gaining momentum. He added sighs and groaned as if he was dubbing a porno until he started giggling. That brought on a fit of coughing. Stop the car! Stop the car! he shouted. I'm going to be sick. I slammed on the brakes, half hoping he'd smash his face into the dashboard. No luck. He threw the door open and staggered to the side of the road ahead of the car so he could use the headlights to see where he was was going. I could see him leaning forward in the headlights, hands on knees, retching. The rain made the scene look like a pointless painting. Then he just slid downwards, down what must be a bank in front of him. I guess he would have yelled, but the rain drowned out any other sounds. I got out of the car, cursing him. At the spot where he'd been standing, I looked down. A half dozen feet or so below me was a swollen and fast-tumbling river. I could hear rather than see him, so I went back for the torch. When I found him, he'd managed to grab the lower branches of a tree on the bank. From the waist down, he was in the water. I was thinking I'd have to go back to the car to get a tow rope when the ground I was standing on gave way beneath me. I let go of the torch and scrabbled to hold the earth as it slid past me. The river was freezing and the rain hit me like lead pellets. Amazingly, the water wasn't as deep as I'd thought. It only came up to my thighs, and I couldn't understand why Sinclair was so submerged. Sinclair, are you there? I called. You fucking moron, why'd you fall in now? How am I going to get out? I'm sorry, I said. I waded closer to him. Listen, it's not that deep. I can... What? What can you do? My fucking ankle's bro- twisted or busted. Jesus. I should have gone with a fucking minibus. Those guys would have known what to do. Sinclair, I- I'm doing my best, okay? Your best? Ha! My hands are going numb. That's when the current took hold of me, and I fell against him, pushing his head under water. He surfaced, angry. Christ almighty! What are you trying to do, you wanker? Kill me? I hadn't thought about it until he said it, and then I pushed the thought from my mind. I was better than him. He might think that, might even do it, but I was better than him. I grabbed for and held a branch of the same tree. Lightning flashed, and I could see we were only a few feet away from a wooden jetty. I was hoping there'd be more lightning, as there were no cars passing and no lights from homes that I could see. The thunder rumbled. Sinclair, can you hear me? I used my right arm to grab him under the shoulders. I wanted him to feel safe. Sinclair, there's a jetty a few feet away. I felt him look round. Sinclair, I need to know if you can hear me. Yes, yes, there's a jetty. Fine, we need to get to it. I'm going to pull you there, okay? Get on with it then. It was really quite easy to get to the jetty. I got there first, making sure he was holding onto one of the pillars, and then I pulled myself onto the deck. I needed to catch my breath before I pulled him up. I got down on my knees and reached round. I got him under the shoulders and hauled him up. I lay him on the deck and he started shivering violently. I lay down behind him and wrapped my arms around him to keep him warm. He began to stir a little. Get off me, you fucking queer! He struggled slightly, but I realised he didn't have much strength. My cock was hard. For the first time in our lives, he was utterly helpless, and I was in control, and that made me hard. I wanted to punish him, take some of that love and security which he'd had all his life from him. I reached round and started unbuckling his belt. He realised what I meant to do, and he twisted to free himself. What are you doing? He sounded scared, and I loved that. I shouted in his ear as I entered him, though I think the thunder drowned me out. He took his vorpal sword in hand, one, two, one, two, and through, and through. The vorpal blade went snicker-snack. It wasn't just him I was screwing. 
There was a gallery of school bullies who I could take revenge on. I was in him and reached round to grab his ball so I could hurt him. He was hard too. I didn't want that. I didn't want him to enjoy it. I fucked him harder and put my forearm across his throat to strangle him. I started gnawing his neck, biting him, wanting to hurt him in every way possible. I came, and then I stood over him. I kicked him, and I kicked him again. It was a rag doll when I had finished. I listened and felt for breath or heartbeat. Nothing. He was cold. I stamped his face a couple of times, then stripped him and pushed him over the edge of the jetty into the water. I hid his clothes in the well of the spare tyre in the car. I called the police ten minutes later, once I'd got my story straight in my head, telling the truth as much as I could, how he fell in the river, how I'd fallen in looking for him, and then found the jetty. They believed me. There was no body to contradict my story, and the rain cleaned everything, washed away my sins. That night, I felt free of him for the first time. Something still worried me. I wanted to know if what I'd done made me gay. I looked up male rape on the internet. Apparently I wasn't that gay, which was a relief. I also found out he was hard, as that's just what happens if you fuck a guy. I wished he wasn't dead. It would have been better if he'd lived with what had happened, had felt confused and ashamed for as long as possible. I have to stay awake. If I'm still for too long, the rats gnaw me. I can feel the air from the blade as it swings past my face. Chip, chop, chip, chop. Last man's head off. In the year that followed Sinclair's disappearance, I frequently heard tales from my parents of what Sinclair would have done, how Sinclair was sorely missed. Sinclair this and Sinclair that. It hardly bothered me. At least they were talking to me. Slowly he was being laid to rest. Dinner on the night he came home was all about him. He explained how he'd been found and hospitalised for nearly three months, and how, when he'd come out, he'd moved in with one of the nurses. His memory had come back only in the last day or two, although, he said, he didn't remember everything. I sat there, listening, waiting for him to reveal what had happened that night, my heart thumping in my chest. I reasoned that as he didn't have the police with him, he couldn't remember. Of course... It might only be a matter of time, so I had to work out a way to kill him. Again. After dessert, I was looking for a moment to excuse myself, so I could go up to my room to read. I needed to read to escape. We must have a toast, said Sinclair. We already had one at the beginning of the meal to your safe return, I said. But this one is to you, James, to your future and our happiness as a family. He went to the bar and poured four shots of whiskey. Down in one, said Father. So I drank my whiskey in one shot. A minute or two later, I remember the carpet suddenly coming up to hit me in the face. Sinclair speaks to me. Hello, James. Are you enjoying your sleep? What have you done to me? I shout, but I can't hear my voice. Sorry, James. That was a rhetorical question. You can't speak as you're in a coma. Looking on the bright side, Mum and Dad are paying for the best care. You have a private room, and I'm coming in to read to you as often as I can. Rest assured, I'm going to be with you frequently, so I can interfere with your medication. I get it now. He's managing my dreams. <laughs> to sleep, perchance to dream, I there's the rub, for in that sleep of death... What dreams may come. Reading from Edgar Allan Poe, he's planting images of deaths in my mind. I wonder which author he'll choose next. I look around for a black bird sitting on a bust of Pallas Athena, a raven which I know will say, Evermore. Go. Cool. Fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind of you to applaud. Right, people can unmute yourselves now, guys. Welcome, everybody. We've got Rachel. Very please good. Unmute yourselves. Max, please unmute yourself. Eric's unmuted himself. 
Yeah. Yay! We're all here. We're all. Thank you. I know Max and uh, Rachel joined in halfway through <laughs> that last one. That was me reading um, from nursery rhymes from What Monsters Do. Did uh, you have any questions? You should read professionally. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Um, Nigel, mm. uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, Fernando. Yeah. What What inspired you? I mean, uh, in the story of James and Sinclair, the hatred of the prodigal, like brother. Yeah. What What, what does inspire you to make that so particularly? Uh, I mean, when I read it, it was so uh, hypnotic, as as like like you were were reading it right now. Uh huh. Um, what 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 kind of inspired it? It was based on I'd had I'd heard I'd, I'd read or heard about people being in comas mm -hmm. and how people sit at their loved one's bedside and read to them. Or they play familiar songs um, in order to encourage them to get people to come back, to come out of the coma. And then I just had the idea, that's really nice, that's really, really interesting. And then, of course, with my dark mind, just thought, that's great, but what if you were a nasty person? What if you actually didn't love the person? And that you are actually seeding the idea of all these dreams and all these, you know. And then I had the uh, the, the quote from, to, you know, perchance to dream, which is from the to be or not to be speech in Shakespeare's Hamlet. I have that flying around as well. And then I, and I just love Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, you're just coming to me for a moment. I'll come back in a moment. Yeah, I'm back again. Um, and I, and I just read Edgar Allan Poe, and Edgar Allan Poe has all these wonderful um, images in his, in his stories, and I just kind of wanted to meld them all together. And once I got the idea of somebody being in a coma and somebody hating them so much um, that they want to do something nasty to them whilst they are in a coma, I thought, well, what, you know, why would anybody do that? What crime is so horrendous? that you would want to do that. Um, and that was the crime that I came up with. Um, like, uh, it, yeah. Emotionally, emotionally, like, sorry about the war, but then emotionally fucking. Yeah. Some say so, because the physic doesn't, the psych doesn't perceive the damage to say so. In the story. Say that again, We seek meaning to uh, the body also receives the, the damage. Yeah. So it all emotionally like disturbingly one another. Yeah. That's amazing. It's really amazing. Yeah, I and I think it's the thing with with you know what I also wanted to do was to play with the idea of um your sympathy with with the narrator. I, I, you know, I, I hope at the beginning you kind of feel sympathy for uh, the narrator. The, you know, this, Sinclair is obviously a complete art. His parents are monstrous. You know, I, I, that line, I lived at the periphery of their vision. You know, he's sent off to boarding school. His parents take his other brother and his brother away. They treat him appall you know, he is treated appallingly. But even so, I hope that by the end of the story that your sympathy is switched and that you're not feeling a sympathetic for you know, you because I th I think what he does is understandable and I did do a, you know, I I researched male rape. Um <laughs> when I was writing that was unpleasant reading. Um all rape is, is horrible, um, but uh, yeah, it, it was 
I, I just wanted people to feel, kind of feel something different uh, and twist that around. Anybody else? Anybody else have any questions or thoughts about that story or what it made you feel or your reaction to it? No, no. everyone's sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the reaction you were hoping for? <laughs> well, I really liked it when you all, um, when you all, uh, <laughs> that's always really nice. And I'm hoping it's encouraged Eric to go out and get the other book and read the other five stories. In that book. I actually have it already. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Excellent. You said you'd just finished. Oh, brilliant. Thank yeah, you very I, much. Uh, I'm in the middle of Barbie's book right now, so once it's done, you're next. Oh, thank you. For, yeah, yeah. It's very good, Barbie's book. Um, I'm enjoying it so far. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So for those of you who are joined us at the very end, I'm just going to kind of recap on um, if, unless there's, you know, any, any other questions? That are not necessarily related to the stories, or is there anything else, any other news or anything people wanted to share? No? We're all happy? That's good. I, Eric, have you, have you, sorry, uh, Derek, have you um, pulled off at the side of the road so that you could join us live? You look uh, no, my, I'm actually in my driveway. Uh, my wife is working out in the house. We have a small house, so there's a lot of noise. So I right. came out to the car. Smart thinking. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a very smart thing to do. Okay, so just, just to repeat, um, for those of you who joined uh, later on uh, in the, um, I think I just wanted to. I'll just repeat the news that I put up at the beginning of the uh, of, of the sh of the uh, show. Um, I'm going to when on the YouTube. If you come to the YouTube link afterwards, I will put up a link to Sophie's Fortune, which is a uh, short film which I saw last year, um, which is really good fun. It's it's about two thousand pound budget. But you'd never believe it when you actually look at this thing. Um, it's not horror. It's it's just a fun. <coughs> film. Um, it's it's a nice way to spend some you know some minutes of your time. And they did a really really good job of it. And it's I it's all about men being boys basically. Um, uh, I have got a couple of um, appearances coming up uh, in October. On the 11th of October, I'm going to be at the Living Dead Con in Liverpool in the United Kingdom. So if you're up in Wales or the Midlands or anything, this, this is going to be your chance to come to meet, to meet me. I will be selling photographs and books whilst I'm there. Um, I'm also going to be at Flashback uh, Weekend in Chicago on the 8th to the 10th of August. So in a couple of weeks' time, both myself and Barbie Wilde are going to be there. So if you're uh, near to Chicago, please come and join us. Uh, it's going to be an amazing show. Robert Englund is going to wear the Freddy Krueger makeup for the very last time. Um, if you've got $350, you can go... Oh, sorry, $365 with administration. You can go and see that happen and have, I think have a photograph taken with him. Um, so for those with deep pockets, um, I think they're going to be showing some Clive paintings there as well. I'm not sure, but there's been a, there may be some Clive stuff there as well. Um, that's, uh, as I say, and then Barbie Wilde is going to be um, uh, joining me on the uh, 24th of August for the uh, for the hangout uh, on the 24th, and we are going to do the luggage in the crypt. Um, interview with Barbie, so I'm going to be asking her what she would take with her into the afterlife. Um, and now, before I let you go, um, if you can spend five minutes with me, I'd like to get your ideas. What I would like to do is to do film reviews. I mentioned this at the beginning of the show. Um, and I'd like <coughs> kind of the format of the film reviews would be that um, I would be, um, I'd review the film give you my opinion of it, and whoever's in the joining me in the, in the, at the bottom, uh, you're all prepared a two, two three-minute review, um, and we put those together, and then um, we have a, you know, we can have a quick discussion. And the idea is to keep the program fairly short, um, so possibly only about a minute or two review uh, as to what you thought of the movie, um, and the idea is to keep the program for about half an hour rather than the hour long. 
I think half an hour on a single movie for a review is probably enough. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what sort of dialogue we can get going. Has, does, it, does everyone li like the idea or not like the idea? Is this something you'd like me to do? What I do you, like the idea. Yeah, you like the idea? Mm -hmm. likes it. Fernando likes the idea. I think it's great. Yeah? Yeah, I'm not, and as I say, I mean, obviously I want to do horror movies. Um, do we want to... Do we want to look at very classic horror movies, or should we just put? Should I just put a poll up? Um, I think it's good. It needs rather than being unless there's something really big coming up. And once I've got this established, we may be able to get a rhythm so that we can get um, give people enough warning, saying, "Okay, we're going to review that. You know, come and join this film." So it's going to be kind of like a film club, as you would have a book club to get together and discuss mm -hmm. what people liked about the movies or thought they could have done better. Or just how scary it was. As I said earlier on, I'm a real scaredy cat. Um, so I, I'm going to award scaredy cats, um, depending on how frightening this movie is. Um, what What do you think? Any particular I, style? I like the idea. Yeah? Uh, well, we, I think we should start with uh, the director's cut of Nightbreed. Oh, the director's yeah. cut of Nightbreed. Oh, cool. Oh, that sounds like a really good idea. That's going to be mm -hmm. out in October now. October. The question is, can I get hold of a copy of it? Because, of course, they're not releasing it in the UK, and I'll have to get a Blu-ray player. <laughs> 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 we might have to do this kind of in November. We might have to do that one in November. Um, I, think that's a really, I think that's a really nice idea, Derek. That's a really cool idea. Um, mm -hmm. we can, uh, you, can sit, you can sit there and hear me whinge if they haven't put enough of me back in again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a very cool idea. Yeah, we should definitely get together and, and, uh, and do that. Um, but, yeah, okay, so definitely do the director's cut of Nightbreed. Shall I just kind of have a think and put up some ideas and then say, okay, who, we'll, we'll vote on... Um, I'll put something up on Facebook. You can do um, surveys on Facebook. Um, and mm -hmm. about, about four or five choices and see which one is the most popular mm -hmm. to review and do a minute review. Yeah? Does that sound like a good idea? Cool. Mm -hmm. We're happy with that. Awesome. Okay, leave, me with that, leave that with me. I'll try and get that sorted out before I go away to Chicago. Um, cool. All right. That's actually us finishing by about oh, four minutes past eight. <laughs> <laughs> This is extraordinary for me that uh, we're actually furnishing on time. Um, <laughs> I will. I. I th this will go up live. What I might do is try and um, edit this a bit so I can see if I can um, take out some of the noise of people joining us. I'm. What I might also do as well is uh, think about how I can actually set this up so I can record these uh, and narrating these things and work on them a bit more and actually put the narrated stories up online as both videos and as um, uh, podcasts. So you can have the uh, sound as well. But that will probably take a few months to actually get that sorted out. In the meantime, thank you, uh, Derek, mm -hmm. um, uh, Fernando, Max, Rachel, Vicky. Uh, thank you all very much indeed for coming to join me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Please spread, spread the word. This will be up on um, uh, YouTube. I'm going to go and have my dinner now. Once I've done that, then I'll start spreading links up on um, uh, Facebook, etc., so people can um, and join us and, have, and can watch this as well. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 See ya. <laughs> Thanks, uh... Thanks for having us. <laughs> my pleasure, <laughs> as always.